Ear hustlers, have you ever sat next to a, a couple who was married and it looked like they hated each other? Come on, don't, don't leave me by myself. Could be real, right? It looked like they, they do not like each other. Believers, do you pray for them? Or do you just observe them? Does God put you in that position so you can speculate? Or is God working through you everywhere you're at? Is God stirring in you everywhere you go? Is there ever a place you're placed that's accidental? Or does God have purpose in every place he places you? Right? But I've seen it. People be, they're married, but they hate each other. I got, I have to say this, Pastor Kevin, give me grace. That's how people see the church. That's how, that's how the world looks at us. That's why when the world finds it to be true, it's true love, they have to swing hard the other way and go, nope, that's fake. That ain't real. They can't believe it yet. So you can't expect people to know, uh, to, to come up against something that's real and automatically receive it because two things are happening. They themselves have been fake for a really long time and they are having struggles to be real with anybody, including themselves. And they have seen fake people for a really long time. So there's your double whammy. But God knows, those of us who can admit that, that I was once fake, I was once putting on a mask, I was once hit, trying to hide, but God came and he loved me and he freed me. And I wanted to swing all the way to the other side and avoid how real it was until God made it real, 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 real. And then I said, okay, I can't run anymore, right? So I want to alleviate the pressure of those that may have been in church for a long time, those that have gone and visited multiple different types of churches and the thing that you're looking for. And I just want to alleviate the pressure and say, you'll never find it by getting up and going and getting up and going. You're only going to find it when you truly sit down and sit in the real thing and that that transparency is going both ways and the work of God is there. That's the only time you're going to find it. So Pastor Kevin, come on up. We're continuing our season of spiritual warfare. <laughs> and even as I was sharing what I was sharing, there's warfare going on right there. Um, but Pastor Kevin's going to bring us a word on the armor of God. It's going to include that, actually. Um, but I want to pray for him. If you Spoiler alert. Right. Spoiler alert. Well, actually, there's more than that. I'm not spoiling the good part that you talked about this morning. Uh -huh. But point your hands towards our brother and let's get ready to receive. Father, as we're pointing our hands towards your son, your servant, we are not looking at him. We're asking, Lord, as we're looking at you to come through him, that he would have the mouth to speak and we would have the ears to listen. We ask for the anointing of God now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Whoo! Do not, do not, do not allow the break of sandwiches to separate you from the worship we just had. Amen. The worship... The fellowship and the word are all part of that same worship. Amen. So don't, let, don't allow the break time to separate you from where God has you or had you during that time. Um, <clears throat> seasons. Seasons are interesting. So mm, it's the season, guys. It's back. Did you know pumpkin spice lattes? <laughs> I was at the store the other day. I have it right here in my cup. The pumpkin spice latte is my favorite time of the year, and the first time I see it, don't judge me, I know it's a little weird, but I will eat anything or drink anything if it's got pumpkin spice flavoring in it. <laughs> if it's a donut, I'll do the Oreo cookies with the pumpkin spice, like, oh, Josh is cringing his nose at me. <laughs> I love me some pumpkin spice. I don't know what it is about the pumpkin spice. But what I don't like about the pumpkin spice is when the season ends and it goes away and then there's no more pumpkin spice. Like I'll go find it at like um, grocery outlet on clearance, you know, I'll buy a couple extra bottles and store it in the fridge so I can have my pumpkin spice latte all throughout the year. Um, as we talk about seasons of teaching and seasons of preaching, um, they're not like pumpkin spice. Do not just say, well, this is a season of spiritual warfare, so we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, and then when the season is done, we can just move on to the next season, because every season is preparing us for Amen. the next, Amen. and it keeps us moving into the following one. So as we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, and as he so boldly spoiled the beans, we're going to talk a little bit about 
the armor of God today. And so I'm calling the sermon Fully Equipped. But as I began to prepare this message, let me tell you, the enemy did not want this to happen. And he did not want me to be ready for what was happening. But also, the Lord was preparing me for something different. And so I'm going to go off into a little bit of a side trail before we move into the actual armor of God. Um, I, I sat down three separate times this week with the, the full intent and focus of writing a sermon specifically about the armor of God, because that's what God had been speaking to me all the previous week. I was like, I already know what I'm going to do. And I sat down fully prepared to do what I knew what I was going to do. And every single time I ran up against a roadblock, I got a phone call. Something happened at the store, like fully manifested demons on a person coming in and cussing out an employee as I'm writing my sermon and she's freaking out. And I'm like, Ugh. so I started praying against the enemy. I started praying against the enemy, and as I was doing that, and then I was re-watching Tony's word from last week, expose and dispose, and the Lord said, you are allowing this. You need to expose it for what it is. You need to expose the enemy. Satan does tempt us, right? He is the ruler of the physical world, um, but we don't say that like to scare people, but also on the other end, he's not just some little hairy imp running around with horns and a pitchfork playing a fiddle trying to take your soul, right? So he's not this, but he's also not what we make him to be. And that's where I think the Lord stopped me and said, he is not more powerful than me. But how much not more powerful is me do we still allow him to be in our lives? Because I didn't realize or didn't think about how much credit I give him for the things that I'm running up against. So one thing we do have to see first, number one, most importantly, God or the enemy, the devil, Satan is not the opposite of God. Amen. So this isn't the, the light side of the force and the dark side of the force. It isn't Darth Vader with a red lightsaber and Luke Skywalker with a blue lightsaber. They both operate in the same power and the same force. No, absolutely not. It does not happen. Only God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Now, if you haven't lived in church like I did, grew up here, what are the omnis? What do those mean? omnipotent means he is all powerful. God can do all things. The enemy only has this much, very limited power. But we credit him with more. We say, look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. He doesn't know our thoughts. He knows where we messed up and he knows how to tempt us into that, but he doesn't know what we're thinking. But we want to go like, Man, he's in my head right now. No, you're in your head and you're allowing him to be there because you're saying he's here. You speak these things out. When somebody says, don't speak that into existence, they literally mean you are speaking it out. The enemy hears it and he's like, oh, I know where to get you. I know what to do with you. He's not omniscient. He does not know everything. He does not know what's going to happen next. He doesn't even know that he's defeated. He thinks in his mind that he can still win this war. And he is not in all places at all times. He is not omnipresent. He is not here right now. He is not with you every time you're struggling. He can send demons. He can still tempt you, but he's not everywhere. We, we want to do that. We want to put him like... Every time I struggle or every time I, but then we want to blame it instead of going like, you know what? There's something in me that I need to work on. There's something in me I need to clear out. And so if we expose the enemy and say, look, you are not this. I'm not going to give you credit for this. We take that power back. We take that power back from him. We give that power back to where it belongs. Most importantly, he was created and if he was created, there's only one that creates. So if he was created, he has to do what? Submit, yeah. obey to the authority, to the one who created him. So even in Job, where God hands Job over to Satan to allow him to tempt, he said, 
but you have to spare his life. The enemy could not go beyond what God would allow. Finally, and this is the most important, it's good to know that he doesn't have power. It's good to know that he doesn't know our thoughts. It's good to know that he's not everywhere, but he is ultimately a coward. And cowards do one thing. They talk a big game, and then they run at the side of trouble. In spite of his bolster and his rage, James says, humble ourselves, rebuke the enemy, or resist the devil, and what? He will flee because he's a coward. Cowards are just like bullies. They like to intimidate people to make them feel less than, right? So that they can what? Assert their dominance and control. We have to pull back and not allow him to bully us into believing that he has power that he doesn't have. So we can't let him. So now that we've exposed the enemy, he doesn't have power. He was created by God, and so were we, and he's a coward. And God gave us the the power and the strength and the name of Jesus to rebuke him. So we do what? We we expose and then we Dispose. dispose. So let's dispose right now. Satan, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of his blood. You are not welcome in this place, in the hearts, in the minds of your people. This is not a place where you are welcome. You are weak. You are a coward. You are created by God and you have no power in this place and with God's people. God, we thank you for the power that you give us. For your son, And most importantly, for the Holy Spirit, for discernment, giving us the ability to see and discern what you would have for us. Lord, help me as I speak today. Give me the strength to know your words and to do your will in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, now we get to the word, Ephesians chapter 6. Are we ready for the teaching part of today's message? Is anybody afraid when it comes to the enemy? I think sometimes we can like, movies love to do that. They love to portray this like great power that comes upon people. Well, if you have the Lord in your heart, he is unable to physically take over your body because we're filled with the spirit. Let's not be afraid. Let's stand in Jesus All right, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 10. If your Bible's like mine, it's entitled something specific, the armor of God. Finally, Paul says, or therefore, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and pray in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. I love how there's a a, a stark contrast here that Paul wants to do between the physical and the spiritual Tony talked last week about the flesh and the spirit and the wars between the flesh and the spirit. Here's what I'm talking about, the actual physical and the actual spiritual. He's contrasting what a soldier does to prepare for war, physical war, 
and what we must do to prepare for spiritual warfare. It's a perfect comparison because if you think about it like this, our bodies, although we can work out and we can make them strong, our flesh is very soft and weak. Our tendons and our joints, even our muscles are squishy, and our organs are very susceptible to almost anything. Especially when you go to battle with sharp pieces of metal or arrows flinging through the air, our body isn't meant to take that on. And in the same way, our spirit, which God designed to be gentle and to communicate with his spirit, was not meant to fight evil. But God, but God equipped us with what? His spirit, so that we can take on the enemy. So as we look through, before we get to the actual piece of the armor, I love how Paul starts with the finally or the therefore because he's, he's ending or finishing a very big uh, letter to this church about how to live a godly life. And if you look back, only one chapter, there's instruction for Christian households, and this is everyone's favorite. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Uh, children, obey your parents. That's one of my favorite areas, right? Because we're all so good at that. Um, and then he's like, but, but it's okay. You know, slaves, love your masters. Like, oh, they're, 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 you know, he touches on some serious things, but then he's like, but God, therefore, but God, we have the ability to do those things which we know we're not capable of only in the Spirit. And so he gives us this analogy, so to speak, of how uh, a soldier protects their body and how God protects our spirit. So he says we have to do it for what reason? For what reason specifically is we're doing it to take a stand against what? We said we just read it. What does it say? Do this so you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. The evil one comes comes later, but the devil's schemes. He didn't say the enemy's power. He doesn't have power. He has schemes. He has tricks. He lies to us and he makes us believe that he is something that he's not. Therefore, we just have to be prepared for the schemes. Uh, and then he says, and it's not against flesh and blood that we fight, but against what? Rulers, authorities, or older Bibles that are my favorite is principalities. What's, what's a principality? It's something that is in the unseen world, and it says specifically in the dark world and forces of evil in the heavenly realms, fighting for what? Our souls. He might have already lost, and we know that he has lost the war, but he's still fighting for our souls because he can still drag us down with him. He wants to drag us down with him. He wants to take as many down with him as he can. So therefore, we have to do what? Put on the full armor of God. And he says full, and he says it twice because he's serious. You can go to Burger King, and you can order your Whopper without pickles. I wouldn't recommend it because pickles are great. But you can order your Whopper at Burger King, and you can have it your way, right? But when it comes to the armor of God, you don't get to have it your way. Every piece of the armor equips us fully for spiritual warfare. And you might say, yeah, I'm really good at this, or I understand this, or I'm, I'm ready for this. But those one, that one area where you're not equipped in, that one area where you're like, oh, I was almost there, that's where the enemy will trip you up. So we start one at a time with the belt of truth. And a lot of people think about a belt in, in a way like, oh, it's kind of a, an interesting piece of garment. And, and why would we talk specifically about a belt when a belt doesn't actually protect a piece of our bodies? Why we're talking about breastplates and we're talking about shields and we're talking about helmets and we're talking about things that actually protect us, but a belt being the first thing up and also the least protective piece of armor, why would he do that? Um, and then what's our parallel? So every single piece of armor says what it is, and then says what it does, right? So we're going we're gonna to look at three aspects of every piece of armor. We're going to look at, first of all, what it does. We're going to look at what it represents. And then we're going to look at how we obtain that piece of armor. So first of all, we're talking about the belt of truth. Why is truth so important? Does anybody know? 
God is truth. But why is it important against the enemy? Because he is the father of lies. He does nothing but lie. He only knows how to lie, and every single word out of his mouth is a lie. And so if we do not know the truth, even a well-crafted lie can sound like truth to us. Has anybody not believed a lie because it sounded really good? I mean, nobody's ever listened to a political ad before? I mean... We want to tell people what they want to hear, and we want to present ourselves in a way where we say, we just, we, we, we've learned to craft lies well ourselves, let's be honest, and we learned it from the father of lies. So truth is important because it's the only way to be able to root out the lies. Amen. And the belt is important because the armor of God, just like the soldier's armor, is held together by the belt or by the truth. If we do not have God's truth in our heart, we can't do anything. But if we're not wearing our belt, we are going to be tripping over everything. We forget that this is written to a people who wore giant robes, right? Loin cloths is what they were kind of called. And in order to go to war, you had to tuck your robe under, pull it up over so that your legs were free to move, right? Because if not, you're tripping over your robe. So you pull it under, pull it over, then the belt goes around and it holds up your garment. But more importantly, it also is tied into the breastplate, which is coming next, and it also holds your sword. That's why it's the first piece, and that's why it's one of the most important. It holds together the armor. The truth of God holds together his righteousness and his word, which is on your hip, at one time. And if we don't have the truth, we literally can't go to war. We would trip over our garments or over our lies, over his lies, and we would fall flat on our face. God's truth is like the strong core, right? If we have a strong core, we can do a lot, right? People like get their arm strength up, but you know, their their legs are weak. Your legs are weak, but your or your legs are strong, but your arms are weak, right? Everybody wants to work on their core, right? Because your core does what? Supports you. It gives you balance. Balance in the center of your body. And that's where the belt comes in, the center of our body, holding everything together giving us balance. So how do we obtain the balance or the unity that comes with the truth of God? We obtain it through Jesus, right? John 14, 6 says, I am the what? The way, the, way, the what, the truth, and the life. I am, he's not saying like, I am a way or I am the way, but I also have the truth or I have the truth or I've obtained the truth. No, he's saying that I am the truth. The truth is me, just like the enemy is a liar. I am the only source of truth. So if you want the truth, if you want the belt wrapped firmly around your waist, holding everything together, we really have to be submissive, submissive to the truth and submit ourselves to God. Amen. Some people say that truth is subjective. It means different things to different people, and that is another lie. Because the truth is the truth. A fact is a fact. You can believe something to be but it doesn't necessarily make it, make it to be, right? You can stand in, a, in the parking lot, but that doesn't make you a car, and you can sit in a church pew, and that doesn't make you a Christian. If you believe something to be, then you believe it to be, but that doesn't make it what it is. That doesn't make it truth. That doesn't make it fact. And man, I love being right. <laughs> sorry, guys. I love how this whole area laughed. <laughs> that's where I, sorry, that's where my family is. Um, I love being right. So much that I will figure out a way to convince myself and others that I'm right by stating a fact, Come on. by putting something down like, well, if this is this and then this, then it has to be this. And I'll stand on that box until it crumbles out from under me, but that does not make it the truth. It makes it my truth or my reality at the time or my desire to make it a truth, but only Jesus can bring us the truth. Right. The belt only comes through Christ. Second piece is our breastplate of righteousness. What does the breastplate do? It protects what? Our heart. One of the most vital organs we have. Without the heart, we stop breathing. We stop existing, 
and it's one of the largest pieces of armor, right? So it protects the largest area of our body, which is the easiest target for most. It represents what? Righteousness. And oh man, righteousness. That's a fun one, right? Uh, I looked it up. I was like, what, is, what, is, what does the world think that righteousness actually means? And it says that it's the quality, the quality of being morally right or justified. It's a quality. Do you have that quality? According to the dictionary, we can obtain that quality. Like, we can obtain righteousness by having the quality of righteousness, by being morally right. Well, I just said I can be right on something but still be completely missing it, right? Because I've just decided that this is right and I'm going to make it right. Moral righteousness or justification isn't something that we can obtain or have quality in or arrive at because of our wisdom or our strength or our own thought process. It's only through Jesus' righteousness, right? And what was Jesus' righteousness that is that he was the only one who was morally right, right? He was, he who knew no sin took on all of our sin and died so that he could what? Give us justification. Make us morally right. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we've attained righteousness now because of that. But instead he said, I am righteousness and I'm going to put myself on you, on your chest, and protect your heart, because in your heart is where? Where Christ is, where our salvation lies. This is what he does for us in his righteousness and not ours. How do we obtain Jesus' righteousness? Simple. We just repent and believe and receive Jesus, right? We deny ourselves. We deny our righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6 says what? Our righteousness is like filthy rags. rags. Just just shed your filthy rags and know that you'll never be right and God is all that is right and then you're done, right? It's easy, right? (laughs) Wrap the truth through that, you're just set. Like, let's do this. Let's go. Um, But it's all just a piece, right? It's all a piece of where Christ is taking us. But we have to be there. We have to know that he is the truth and then we have to take on his righteousness in our heart. This is a step in the process of sanctification, just like it's a step in the process of equipping ourselves for the war. The, uh, the next part is the, the sandals of peace, or the sandals that come from the peace of the gospel. There's always an interesting one, the footwear or the footgear, uh, different ones say di- different things, or like mine says, um, keep your feet footed or feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel. And it's interesting what that looks like because we look at footwear in a different way. (laughs) I wore wore these shoes for a specific reason. Uh, So I don't, I'm not a flashy person. I don't, like this is the only pair of Jordans that I've ever owned in my life. And I just obtained them last week in a deal uh, I was buying a camera from a guy on offer up, and I was trying to work the deal a little bit. I'm a, I'm a shrewd negotiator. And uh, I was like, well, I was on your offer up, and I saw that you also had this pair of Jordans. Um, they're my size. Would you throw them in on the deal? And he, he's like, he's like, oh, yeah, sure. And then he went and grabbed them, and he brought them out. And I was like, yeah. So I, I was excited, right, because the Jordan 13s came out in 97 originally. These are the 2010 ones. But they came out in 97, and I was in high school, and I remember everybody had the red and blacks. And I loved the red and black thir- 13s, man. And I was like, man, I've always wanted the pair of Jordans. And I put them on the other night. His wife's like, oh, put on something nice. We're going to go out. You're going to take me out. And I was like, I'm going to put on something nice. I'll put on my new Jordans. I put them on. And I was walking through the house. And she was like, what do you have on your feet? She was like, those are the ugliest things I've ever seen. And, and you're walking ridiculously. And I was like, well, I can't bend the shoe boxes, babe. I gotta keep, the toe box has got to stay fresh. They're used. They're used, so it, it doesn't matter that much. But I was just like, I can't bend them. She's like, you look ridiculous. Go change your shoes. She let me wear them today, but only because I told her it was part of the sermon. So I had to tie it in somehow. But we think of shoes as function outside of 
fashion, right? We want fashion. We want to look good. We want people to notice us. Don't, don't step on my shoes. Don't, you know, don't scuff my kicks. Uh, I, want to, I want to wear this one with this shirt, with this thing, and I want to look this way, and I want people to notice me. But in the Bible, the sandals were the most important I, I, I want to, every single piece is the most important piece. Let's, let's just go there. Let's just go there before we come back here and say that for the Roman soldier, their footing was crucial to their speed, to their agility, and to their effectiveness. So these weren't just like cool kicks, right? You, like you wear basketball shoes to play basketball because they do what? They, they protect your ankle, their ankle support. You wear uh, running shoes because they protect your arch or they have the right bend or the right flex for your foot. You wear different shoes for different functions and the same thing goes for the soldier. Thick pieces of rubber protected their feet from rocks, from the elements, from the things that would come underneath it. But inside of that rubber was spikes that they would, they would hammer into the bottoms, the soles of, of these, just like a football cleat. So a football player wears a cleat so they can get what? Traction, Traction or grip so that they can turn and move and be more agile. And the same thing goes for a Roman soldier. If they could not move or function or be agile in battle, then they were less effective in what they did. And finally, they tied them together with these ropes, and they tied all the way up and around their ankles, kind of like those weird shoes that ladies wear that like, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> you must have a pair, because you... <laughs> but, but what it was was it was... The same thing a basketball shoe would do. It was ankle support. They would wrap around the stronger part of your, your ankle so that it would support your, your heel and your foot and keep it from breaking or shifting. But what happens, we've seen, we've seen it a, a hundred times, right, football players, what happens when they cut too fast and their cleat digs in and their foot doesn't release properly and they do what? They twist their ankles. So we have to be careful um, with the gospel because if we move on our own, in our own strength, with our own abilities, outside of, right? If we're walking funny because we don't want to mess up our kicks, we're walking funny in the gospel. That's not what, that's not what Christ wants. So we got support. We got the base. We got the foundation. That's what the sandals do. But what do they represent they represent the gospel of peace. So the shoes support us, right? And they give us the ability to do what? Maneuver what? <laughs> the gospel, right? So this is an interesting part of this armor. So we've looked at pieces that hold us together. We've looked at pieces that protect us. But the shoes actually help us to stay agile or stay mobile. Because what the enemy wants to do is stop us in our tracks and make us less effective for the kingdom so that we cannot go out and tell people about Jesus. We cannot spread the gospel of peace. Isaiah calls it beautiful feet, right? We go with beautiful feet when we go. So we stay agile, we stay mobile, we, we stay functional with the gospel, the peace of the gospel that it gives us, and then we're able to go out and spread it to others. He wants to stop us in our tracks and go, you're at war, freeze. And Paul's saying, no, we do not freeze. We, we, we equip and we keep moving. We advance forward. We always advance. Amen. The enemy wants to discourage us and knock us off balance. He wants us to keep moving weird, right? We, we can't move weird. I love when she said that. You, you're walking weird. And I was like, sometimes we walk weird. Because we walk in our own strength, right? We put our own shoes on. We want to look cool, but we forget that Christ is the one that does the walking. But the enemy wants to paralyze us. He uses things like fear, comfortability, ease of life, worry, pride, shame, doubt. Oh, we're going to talk about doubt. Let's get there. Let's talk about the shield first. The shield is interesting because we see shields in different ways, in different places. You know, Iron Man's got his iconic shield and everybody loves the, the shield. There is two different types of shields and one is a shield kind of like Iron Man's shield. It's a, 
Iron Man. Am I calling? Am I saying Iron Man? What is wrong with me? <laughs> hey, Iron Man's got a shield too. You're just not reading the right books. <laughs> you ain't seen uh, Civil War when he takes the shield from him? Okay, no, I'm just I'm okay. I can't be right. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. So we're talking about um, shields and uh, agents of shield. I mean, uh, sorry, we're talking about <laughs> Captain America shield. So a round, small round shield that goes on one arm, right? That shield is meant for hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? So we can protect a part of us, but only against one person, right? A one-on-one -on -one combat type of deal. But Paul's talking about a different kind of shield here because he says that our shield does what? It extinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one. So this is a different type of shield. So the, like I said, there was two types of shields that Romans used. One was the small shield, the hand-to-hand -hand shield. And the second shield was, they called it a door shield. Two and a half feet wide by four and a half feet tall. It was literally a door. And you walked around with a door on your arm. But this shield was what they used in combat where there was arrows. And the thing about this shield is, because of its size, you could stand behind it and protect almost your entire body. But more importantly, they would create walls side by side by side with people behind and in the back covering an entire area of the field, not just protecting one man, but the entire army. And that's what the shield of faith does. It doesn't just strengthen us. It doesn't just protect us, but it allows us to come together in fellowship and to help and protect and lift up one another. But it's not our faith, right? We, we sometimes make the mistake of going like, oh, it's, through grace, it's grace through my faith that saved us. No, it's Christ's faith. It's God's faith. He gives us the faith. So that shield of faith is a faith that we have because of him. Amen. He gives us, he equips us with, he puts it on our arm, he lets us stand in front of it. We can believe something. Me and Tony had an interesting conversation this morning at the gym, and he was like, man, you can believe something to tr be true, and you can have faith in it. I have faith in my football team, the Dallas Cowboys, that they will win the Super Bowl. And if any of you guys know anything about football, you know that that's probably not going to happen Amen. now or ever again. But because I believe in that team, <laughs> I, I, A, that's, I've come to the realization that my football team sucks, guys. I'm better off you know, with the Yankees because uh, bats are hitting this year. Anyways, but we can have faith in our team, but that's not the same thing, right? It's more of belief. I believe in because I like them because I want to believe in them. But faith in Christ and what the faith that Christ gives us is a way different faith. This is, I can do all things. I can do what's unseen. Um, we were talking about like really letting go, fully surrendering, like not holding on to anything. And I thought of the cloud. Do you guys, do you guys trust the cloud? Have you sent all of your data to the cloud? Do you know where the cloud is? What is the cloud? Where's the cloud at? What happens if the cloud breaks? You're, nobody trusts in the cloud. You send all your stuff to the cloud and then you hope. No, we want to keep a hard copy, right? We want to keep a backup. Where, is it on a flash drive? Is it on a floppy disk? Oh, man, floppy disk. <laughs> floppy disk. You know, we want to keep a hard copy. We want to know that there's a physical backup of what we have that we hold dear because if we send it to the cloud, we don't know where it's at. We don't know what's going to happen if we lose it, and then we're going to be devastated by it. We keep our family photos and our important things. We back them up to the cloud, but that backup is really something that we don't really fully trust in or understand. Have you been able to fully trust and surrender and back up to the Lord? Give everything over and not hold on to one piece or keep a backup of something in your life where you're like, yeah, I can give you all of it, but just want to hold, like that's what real faith is. The faith that stands in front of us and says, I got you. Amen. We don't realize that the redundancies of the cloud, they're servers on top of servers on top of servers, and they back each other up. If we really understood what the cloud was, we would know that we really don't have anything to worry about, that the cloud is not going to delete our data. It's not going to go anywhere. 
Like they pay hundreds of millions of dollars to keep things in the cloud. We're good. But we still want to hold on to things. And Jesus is saying, nope. The shield of faith is what protects you. Amen. If you release everything, if you stand behind it and know that nothing will hit you, you're covered. So how do we obtain the type of faith that comes from Christ and not from us? We can't. We can't obtain it. Faith comes only by hearing the word, and the word comes from Christ, and so does the faith. We just have to, we just have to surrender. We have to let go. How do I surrender? I can't tell you that. It just doesn't. That's not how it works. Like, literally what surrendering means. Like, if I have to know how it works, if I have to understand it, if I have to, like, put it down, like, see the instruction manual. Show me the the instruction manual on surrender and faith, Lord. And then he's going, you've missed it. You've already already passed. It's already gone. Man. Are we teaching or are we preaching here today, guys? The helmet of salvation can I tell you a story? It's not going to be as funny as my thumb story. I'm sorry, guys. That was a one-time deal. Um, this one's a little bit more serious, and I had to write it out because there's a lot to it. It's, it's two pages, so bear with me for a minute as I tell this story. Um, this is a story that I actually heard a sermon on from a pastor 15-plus years ago, and every once in a while, God reminds me of it. And I had to go look it up to find it because I was like, I, I remember that story that one time about Satan's yard sale. Has anybody heard the Satan yard, Satan's yard sale story? She has because she was there when, when, it, when, it, was, when it was told. But So I once heard of Satan having a yard sale. Satan advertised that he was selling off many of his tools. He put them on display, some of the best items out, shiny polished, ready to sell. Many of the demons and evildoers showed up to see what the devil was selling. They came from all around to see what they could purchase to improve their shameful skills. Each tool sold almost immediately after it was priced and put out. Satan carefully marked each item, $100 for anger, $400 for resentment, $600 for hatred, and the tools sold one after another after another. Anger flew off the shelf pretty, pretty quickly, but for a cheap price, because let's, let's just face it, it's common and it's easy to come by. We all have a little bit of it. But more effective things like greed brought a bigger price. Pride drove the bids really high. Multiple copies of Jealousy were a hot item. Lust was always a bargain basement price, because let's just face it, it sells itself. There were tools that make everything easier to tear down others, stepping stones, some lenses that magnify one's importance, and when you look through the other side, they belittle others. There was an assortment of gardening implements that help one's pride grow, and uh, also rakes that brought about scorn, shovels that brought jealousy, along with all types of tools of gossip and backbiting, selfishness and apathy, all were pleasing to the eye, and completed the works of these, those who bought them. One visitor, as he browsed, noticed a single well-worn tool on a back table, nondescript, no name, and no price. He found it curious that there was no tag on this item and that it was more used than all the rest of the tools on the shelf. And he asked Satan, and Satan just laughed and said, well, that's because I use it so much. Uh, If it wasn't so plain looking, people might actually see it for what it was. This seemed to please the old man. He snatched the tool up and said, how much is it? I must have it. And Satan said, sorry, that tool's not for sale. Without hesitation, the man said, I will pay any amount. The devil narrowed his eyes and said, I told you it's not for sale, nor will I ever sell it. It is the most useful tool I own. Without it, I would be half as effective as I am. With that tool alone, I can do what a hundred of these other tools can do in one single swipe. Disappointed, the man moved around looking at the other more shiny tools. Sad look on his face. He finally, almost whispering, asked the devil, well, if I can't buy it, at least tell me what its name is. A slow, wicked grin 
grew across the devil's face and he said, see that tool I call doubt. And it is, it will work when nothing else will. The devil continued, that is the most useful tool, more useful than any others. And when I cannot bring down my victims with the rest of my tools, I use doubt because with it, I can accomplish every single task. Perplex, the old man says, well, what's so special about this tool? He says, nothing paralyzes a person. Nothing stops someone in their tracks like doubt, resulting in hopelessness. Doubt keeps the unemployed unemployed, the homeless homeless, and the sick sick. Doubt can even draw the most powerful ministry to its knees. And when overcome with doubt, it always leads to hopelessness. People can't pray, they can't worship, and they become a victim of their environment. Doubt drains a victim of their courage, their vision, their faith, their expectations, and it will make a difference against the kingdom of God. If I can get people to be filled with doubt, then I have successfully neutralized them and they are left with only one thing, hopelessness and feeling sorry for themselves. The helmet of salvation does one thing. It protects our mind. Our mind is a valuable place and we can easily become susceptible to doubt. We say, man, I've been working on my anger. I've been working on my patience. I've been working on, God's been working these things out in me. And then when we're alone, it's easy for us to doubt God or doubt what he's done or doubt the faith or doubt the salvation. And when we doubt our salvation, literally every other tool becomes more effective. When we doubt our abilities, when we doubt our calling, when we doubt what God has said to us directly, we lose it. It's easy for us to get tripped up in our mind when we do not allow the Spirit to protect our mind. But what happens? We we fill our minds with the things of this world, watching too many and other and not the right or whatever it is. I'm not going to stand here and convict you of what the Holy Spirit's convicting you of. What is it that you are putting into your mind today, yesterday, this week, that allows the Spirit the enemy in to just grow that seed of doubt because the doubt starts small, right? Doubt is like a spore, single spore of mold in the dark, hidden away from others. It grows and grows and grows until it's consumed everything. So the, the helmet protects our head. This is where we know who Christ is, right? This is where we know, this is where we know, Right? Our, we're saved. This is our heart, but this is our mind. And our mind can then what? Pollute our heart. So he starts here, and then he works his way down here. This is the smallest hitbox, but it is the most effective, yeah. right? Romans 12, 2, it says that we have to what? Be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. Christ wants to give us a new mind. That's how we obtain the helmet of salvation, the knowledge of our salvation is obtained through the renewal of our mind. We have to focus on Christ and allow him to feed our mind and not be fed by the world or by what the enemy would say or by the doubt that he would want to bring bring upon us. It comes from hearing, watching, seeing the word of God. And finally, last but not least, we have the sword of truth. Paul kind of spoils it, right? He says it's the sort of truth that what is the what? It's the word of God. This is our sword. This is what we use. He gives us a lot of weapons to protect us, right? To prevent things from happening. We have, we're on defense, right? We're, we're, we're preparing for war, but it's not a defensive war. It's an offensive war. We don't go into battle offensively, uh, not offensively, offensively uh, with our sword without the rest of the armor on first because we have to protect as we move forward as we advance as our feet are moving us god's word is the best weapon against the enemy and it's also the best defense against the enemy we think about it in one way like the sword 
only cuts, but it's two-sided. It cuts both ways, the flesh and the spirit. It does cut down what the enemy is trying to do, but it also protects us from what the enemy is trying to do. It says that The Bible says that Satan comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And we think about those things also in the physical. And he doesn't want to snatch your purse. He's not trying to take your life. He doesn't want to destroy your house or your property or your goods or your, you know, he, he will eventually do those things. But what he wants to do is he wants to steal your joy. He wants to snatch the truth from you. He wants to kill your hope and the purpose that God has given you in your life. And he wants to destroy what? What, is, what, did, what did Tony say earlier? The kingdom of God is what? In us. He wants to destroy the kingdom of God in us. Steal, kill, and destroy. We look at physically, but we forget that it's all spiritual. But the source of joy and hope and the truth of the purpose that God has given us is found only in Somebody say it, please. Yes. Victory is only found in the word. God's kingdom reigns forever in his word. So let us put on the full armor of God so that we are fully equipped for war. Let's pray. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the equipping the armor, the provision, what you give us. Can I? I don't, I didn't plan this and I, and I probably wouldn't normally do this, but I feel the spirit right now leading to something. And I want to, while your eyes are still closed, while your heads are still bowed, I want to give an opportunity because this is one of those opportunities where the Holy Spirit spoke and a word was given and something pierced. And if we don't allow that to affect or to change or to move or there to be something different when we walk out of this place today, then what did God do? We heard something cool. We talked about some shoes. But that's not what God wanted to do today. So if, you're, if you are saved, if you are a believer, if you have Christ in your heart and you've, you've been struggling with some stuff and there were some things here today that were said, uh, hold on a second, I'm going to talk to you in a minute. But if you don't know that you are saved, if you don't have Christ's salvation in your head and planted firmly in your heart and you are not sure that you can even put on this armor because you're not prepared, I want to give an opportunity right now for us to do that. Nobody else looking around, doesn't matter if you came with your friend or your wife or, you know, your coworker or somebody else, uh, it's just you and Christ. He's reaching out. If that's you, would you just look up at me? You don't need to do anything more than that. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. I see you. I see you. Let's pray a prayer together. You guys ready? Everyone's going to pray in agreement because we're all believers. Heavenly Father, you repeat after me. There we go. We got to go. Heavenly Father, I surrender. I've done it on my own. I've failed. I need you. I repent of my sins and my self righteousness. Equip me with your armor. Fill me with your spirit. And show me your love. Amen. Keep your heads bowed. If you would say, I am a believer, I know I have Christ in my heart, but I have allowed the enemy to give me doubt, to put things into my mind, to affect my walk, to make me weird. If that's you today and you say, you know, I, I'm firmly planted in Christ, but I want to start walking in the fullness of that, in the fullness of If that's you today, would you, would you raise your hand? I'm going to ask you to take one step further, a little bit further than, than, than those who have not. 
Thank you. Thank you. I see you. I see you. I'm raising my hand too. Like, to be real here. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray this in agreement together, everyone. Father, show me your mercy. I need you. I love you. Protect my heart. Protect my mind. Fill me with your spirit to overflowing. Show me what you would have for me. Reignite the passion in me. Reignite the joy in me. Reignite the purpose that you've put on my life. I rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of his blood, you have no hold on me in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Spirit releasing you yet? Oh, man. You good? You're making me weird, Tony. <laughs> Don't act like you've never done an altar call before, brother. Come on now. As I slowly pull the table back. Um, that's what I'm saying. I was just about to say, do you receive it, church? I feel equipped. I, I feel protected. I feel clothed. I have a helmet on right now. It's not later today. It's as the word is being preached, I'm being equipped, I'm being clothed. God is meeting me. It's, it's interesting to me that, you know, because we preach or we get up here that there's this disconnect. You know, this isn't a worldly gathering. This isn't, you know, what's that guy's name now? Something Peterson. What's his name? No, he's like a philosopher. Jordan Peterson, right? This isn't Jordan Peterson getting up and people asking questions and he's the smart guy. God is the smart one. And we're being met by God. It's not about us up here. But when we when God gives us this place to speak, our hearts must must hear the Lord. We must look past the vessels. We must look past the Jordans. Right? The analogies. And we must receive it and say, Okay, God, you're you're giving me a shield here. Right? Who who goes to a restaurant and then doesn't eat the food? I mean, nice food. Looks really great. I think I'll make that when I get home. Where's the bill? Right? It's, oh, you've, this has been prepared and provided for. Eat up. Right? This has been prepared and provided for. Wear it. And it fits you perfectly. As I was joking with Sister Jen about how tall she is, and I probably do it a lot. I poke at her a lot. Well, I try to. I step on a stool and I poke at her a lot. But... <laughs> But it, the truth is, is that the armor of God fits her and me and you and every child to every adult. Like it's made for that. It's it's God. Right. The armor of God is God. The one thing that Kevin, uh, Pastor Kevin left out is that and I'm going to share this with you, is that you can't you, when you can't put on Christ without Christ. You know, it, you can't walk up to Jesus and say, now get over here and you, know, you just go limp and let me control you. It's a relationship to where when Jesus comes, now you're saying, that's for me? Okay, and you're doing it together. He's, he's working in you and through you, and you're doing it. It's a moving organism. Amen? Adults, just be adults with me here. But there's an egg and a woman, and there's a sperm and a man. The two become... Think about that. There's a spirit in you, and there's a spirit in God. And the two become, so you're no longer working by yourself. So as he's preaching and I'm being edified, right? This is my brother, right? So I'm being edified. These are just a couple things that I wrote down. He talked about the devil being, being uh, not being powerful, right? The scriptures say he's like a, so he's like a, Jesus is a roaring lion. There's a big difference between 
him being like one and Jesus being one. Say amen. You receive it when you say amen, right? So Jesus is a roaring lion. The devil has to submit. Jesus willingly laid his life down. No one could take his life. The devil, he's going into eternal flames. So Jesus, he's not in that same situation with the devil. Jesus has full relationship with the Father. And now Jesus lives in us, so we are in full relationship with the Father. He said, I got this. And, man, when he was talking about, like, I'm really, really good at certain things, or I like to be right. We all related to that. I could never be wrong. You know, there's some of us that we still are really proud. We're like, nah, man, I keep my car clean, my money crisp, right? I'm, I am made, I'm doing this. Everything's made right here. But let me talk to the sisters real quick. There's a certain thing called a bad hair day. Some of us, we take pride, like, I got my, man, when it's a good hair day, you know what I mean? You look in the mirror, mm -mm, you do the duck lips. <laughs> I know. <laughs> she said, ew. Well, I do the duck lips. How about that? No. But, you, but, but when it's a bad hair day, you could do everything you try to do, and it makes it worse. Am I speaking to you? It just, it got that static going. You just can't get rid of the static. You're like, that's it, I'm wearing a hat, Right? But that's like our, that's like our, our human nature. We, we think that we can be righteous, and there's just times, no matter what you do, everything's bad. So we're really not capable of upholding the standard that we try to put on ourselves. And so instead of trying to act like you wear the armor of God, wear it. Instead of trying to make your own carbon copy of it, Receive it because it is good all the time. It will protect all the time and free all the time because it's Christ. Think again. Belt of who's the, who's the truth? Chest plate of whose righteousness? Say Christ because it is his righteousness. Shield of, see, this is the hard one. When people hear faith, they go, oh, that's my faith. Really? So all that's Jesus, but you the most important part. <laughs> Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without Christ, it's impossible to please God. The sword of the Spirit. Who's the Spirit? Christ. Christ is the Spirit of wisdom. Christ is the Spirit. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the full expression of God. Helmet of? You know, they call him Yeshua. You know what Yeshua means? Salvation. Think about it. The gospel, there's no gospel without Christ. The entire armor of God is the one man. It's the, the Lord, God, man. It's Christ. And God has made it simple for you. Put on Christ, and you get the whole thing. You get the whole thing. Now, a couple more, and then we'll pray. And, and close and dismiss. You prayed over the word. I'm going to dismiss the service. But he said, just say this. Say, I can't obtain moral perfection. You cannot obtain moral perfection. Very important. And, and what does that mean? You know what's worse than thinking that you're doing everything right? It's believing that you're right even when you're admitting you're wrong. Do you hear what I'm saying? You ever see a person try to act like they're humble? I'm a very humble person. You just ruined everything. You just showed how proud you really are. But I'm admitting I'm wrong. But your admission is full of pride. Your admission is wanting to be seen as righteous. Your admission, the heart posture, is wrong. And instead of saying, well, my heart posture is wrong, you want to get away from the heart posture. See what I'm saying? So it's our heart that's wrong. That's why he said the heart is deceitfully wicked. That's why our righteousness is filthy rags, because it's all built on that. But Christ, Christ's heart is right. Amen. And then one last thing, the Iron Man shield. That's my, 
that's your tag now, brother. Every time I see you, where's your shield, Iron Man? <laughs> but the Iron Man shield. And you see God is so sovereign that you prepared seven pages. He said, I got seven pages. As a matter of fact, you did in 45 minutes. I was actually pretty impressed about that. Those must have been big words or something. But you did seven pages. He said, I got seven pages prepared for this word, but yet you still messed up. You said the Iron Man shield. Now watch what happened in that honesty, though. Had no one corrected him, right? Hey, do you mean Captain America? Wait, what did I just say? <gasps> right? And he what? I'm wrong. If there were a child who never knew of either, of any superheroes, and you told them Iron Man had a shield. In your innocence of believing you were saying the right thing, could you mislead them? Now, this is the problem that people tend to have when getting into the freedom of Christ. You cannot finesse God. And you cannot control God. And you, you don't have the capacity to remember everything. You are not God. I am not God. We can be as prepared as we want to be. Right? As prepared as we want to be. I sat here and I go, where's the legs, man? They got the rest of the body. I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to say, why didn't you give me something for my legs? You gave me my chest. You gave me my helmet. and got everything else. Why my legs? Why are they exposed? I, I got small calves. We talk about this all the time. And it's because of the faith, right? The, the mobility, all of that. But it's the faith of God. And I thought that was interesting because your legs, you, that's what grounds you and it makes you stand firm. But God needs you free. He needs you free to move. He doesn't, he doesn't want you stiff in the armor. He wants you mobile. See? What does that mean, though? That sometimes you're going to get cut. And sometimes you're going to get touched. And sometimes the enemy is going to allow you to fall into sickness. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying because, see, when we think of the armor, we're like, keep me from experiencing pain. Keep me from experiencing doubt. Keep me from experiencing these things that are going to attack me. I want the, the fiery dart to be quenched over there. I don't want it to hit my faith. I don't want it up against me. This is what we do. So this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Faith will cause you to die for the gospel. But the armor's supposed to protect me. Not your physical body, guys. Not your physical body. It's not meant for you to be healed forever in this body. This body's decaying. It's dying. Please tell me that you're there already. Please that you tell me you've had that conversation with God that I cannot stop this body from dying. So when you pray for someone sick, it's not so you can have a righteous deed. It's so that God might be seen. But if the person dies, it's that God might be seen. So no matter which way it goes, it's that God, the, the whole armor of Christ is meant so that God might be. It's for the gospel. It's not for you. It's not for the physical thing. That's the truth right now. Because if you go to Hebrews, you're going to see by their faith, they overthrew kingdoms by their faith they escape death and lions but if you keep reading by their faith they were sawed in half that's the sobering reality of this thing we're talking about that the spiritual armor is not supposed to make every marriage work the spiritual armor is not supposed to keep people from dying in the physical death the spiritual armor is not meant to keep you from losing a business. The spiritual armor is not meant so you can have comfort. The spiritual armor is meant so you could be saved, which is, has to do with the kingdom of God. And you may lose everything to be saved. You're going to find this to be ironic, but if God happens to allow you to have businesses and land and all of it, Mark my words, it's so you can lay it down. Amen. It's never for you to live in it. You might walk through it, but it is not the goal. Amen, Amen church. Amen. So wear the armor, yes. not so you can have a better marriage, but that God would be seen in the marriage. Mm, 
you're not going to like what I have to say right now. I might ruin the whole sermon, but it's okay. A marriage that falls apart over Christ is better than a marriage that's kept together in Satan. Because the person who really loves their marriage, and maybe it's being exposed right now, you're not able to really hear what I'm saying. You think I'm promoting divorce, which shows that your father's the devil. If you're thinking that, the enemy is truly lying to you because God hates divorce. God hates divorce between you and him. So he will remove a spouse. That's, that's the scary reality to people who love this life. Now, I love my wife. Been married 20 years. I'm pretty sure we're going to, one of us is going to die, right, in this marriage. I'm not, we're not looking for nobody else. But that's not the goal. And when God is seen in the marriage, that's the goal. He will keep the marriage together, but I don't want to manipulate God. I don't want God so he can keep the marriage together. I want God even when she dies. Some of us right now, even by the quickening of the Holy Spirit, like, I don't want my spouse to die. They're going to die. They're going to die, guys. Do not turn away from that. And they could die young. So if it's bringing doubt and fear, know who's talking. Because God is saying, I got a greater plan. That death cannot hold. This life cannot hold. I am God. He's saying that. So may that minister to all of us. And we, we truly remove the devil now. Because the true trick of the enemy is to get you to fear death. But the true life of God is, oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? Where is your sting? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for using everything in this service to reach our souls. And I pray for salvation to truly take root in the heart of the one that was struggling before this. May they find new hope in you. And may they embrace the wrestle. And may you win out, as you always do. In Jesus' name, amen. Love each other and mean it.